our sister uh, Fatima says that she has to take a medicine and that medicine has gelatin in it and so she is confused is gelatin in medicinal tablets permissible standard question we always get asked it so today inshallah we will uh, answer this question in an academic fashion <laughs> فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون Firstly, what is gelatin? Gelatin is a type of protein. It is derived from animal tissue. It is a form of collagen. And it has properties that makes it useful for various foods and medicines. Of them is that it can be very easily made, relatively tasteless and odorless. And it has a protective layer. So it can be made to basically... Uh, put medicine inside it and you have the gelatin capsule outside of it, right? So it's odorless and tasteless and you're preserving the stuff inside of it. Or you can add sweet and make the gelatin itself into a sweet. Think of jello. Jello is exactly gelatin. That's what gelatin is, right? Jello is nothing but gelatin. So that, that material which is, you know, just enough permeable and what not to enjoy, to eat g gummy stuff and you put some sweet in it or sugar. So gelatin can put give texture to a food, it can protect the food inside of it. It's something that can be very useful in many different uh, 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 types of food and that is why we find it in so many different food products. Now, where does gelatin come from? There are four primary sources of gelatin. Number one, animals. Number two, fish. Number three, plants. And number four, synthetically produced, okay? These are the four so primary sources of gelatin. Now. We are talking about the first one. If, if gelatin comes from fish, it is halal for us. If gelatin comes from plants, it is halal. If gelatin is synthetically manufactured in a laboratory, it is halal. However, don't quote me, but like 80 to 90% of the gelatin in the world comes from the first category, which is animals. You do not find gelatin from plants except with great, great, great difficulty. Those that are strict vegans and they will not take gelatin from animals, they will somehow when they manufacture their pills they will go to the gelatin from plants and therefore the price is going to be jacked up because it's more difficult etc so that's very rare to find gelatin from fish is also very rare because i mean come on fish bone seriously it's not easy to do right so uh some types of gelatin comes from fish and typically when it does it will also have the label on there but these are very rare as for synthetically produced gelatin as far as i know as far as i know you will not find it in any food product because to produce synthetic gelatin is like 50 times more expensive than to just extract it from animals so why would anybody produce it in a lab nobody produces it in a lab and then puts it in a food product it costs too much so the default when you pick up a product and it says gelatin where is it from what's the default animals ignore the other three categories unless it says so if it says and i've seen this with my own eyes gelatin in brackets plant derived if you find this on the product 100 percent halal and generally, when the corporation is using plant gelatin, it will want to tell you. Why? Because it's advertising to the, to the vegans. Okay? So, we are now talking about gelatin that is animal-derived, and that is the default. Now, obviously, obviously, now gelatin is derived typically from the meat and the joints and sometimes even the skin of the uh, animals. Obviously, if you're going to use animals that have been slaughtered according to the laws of Islam, so the animal itself is tahir and it is dhabiha and what, what not, obviously, if you make gelatin from those bones, gelatin is halal, okay? Nihari is one step away from gelatin. Desi log, Nihari, Nihari is one step away from gelatin and it is 100% halal, okay? So when you invite your next make your next nihari, I have to come and make sure it is halal for you as well. Make sure you invite me for that. So, uh, obviously when the bones are halal, what you produce from the bones is halal. But, when you go to the marketplace, are they using the bakra from Eid al-Adha? No. They're using, where, which animal do they use most? Khanzir, pig. Why do they use pig the most? It's the cheapest for them. 
And also, by the way, the most gelatin comes from those bones as well, by the way. It's two reasons. First, pigs are cheap for them, easy. They're, and then no, number two, the amount of gelatin they extract from that quantity is more from pigs than from other animals. So the default when you see gelatin in the Western world is that it is not just coming from a animal, it is coming from the one animal that you don't want it to come from, which is khinzir. Now, I know that some Muslim countries produce gelatin. And if it's a Muslim country producing gelatin, the assumption should be the gelatin is halal. Because it, we do not expect any Muslim country to produce from khanzir. They're going to be producing it from uh, cows and whatnot, and we assume it is halal. But we are worried about now the non-Muslim lands that we live in. So we say the mo most of the gelatin that comes from the uh, substances that we purchase on our shops here in this part of the world, it is actually coming straight from the most najis animal, and that is the pig. So with that, that was all the introduction. Now we get to the big issue. And this is an issue that I want all of us to know. It's a simple rule of fiqh. Does something that is najis become tahir when it changes? This is the question. Or does it always remain najis? If the source of something is najis, will it always be najis? Or when it changes, it will cease to be najis, and we can now say that it is tahir, it is now pure. The Arabic term for this, the fiqhi term for this is istihala, istihala. And all of you, without exception, know the root of this word because you say it all the time. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Hawl means, hala yahulu means what? State. Change, state. Istihala. To change from one hawl to another, to change from one state to another. This is what istihala means. It is the technical term that the books of fiqh use about changing substances and products. And this is a classical topic of Islam. You will find discussed in all the madhabs. And the question is, does istihala make the najis tahir? That's the question. Okay? And you will find, and this is an, and it's an interesting point, because actually, inshallah, our minds will think about this. In early Islam, what I call classical Islam, the majority of the madhabs and scholars said, no, it does not. And it is the standard position of the Shafi'i school, and it is the Mu'tamad, the accepted of the Hanbali school, and it is the well-known also in the Maliki school as well, that something which is najis will always remain najis. However, the Hanafi school, mashallah, tabarakallah, they were the forward thinkers here. And they said, istihala renders najis into tahir. Something that was najis, when it undergoes a transformation completely, it ceases to be najis and it becomes tahir. Okay? And, and I'm going to be very explicit here. Subhanallah, I, I hope this doesn't also the 10 second clips and then the refutations, I have to be conscious of them all the time, subhanAllah. Our classical scholars with utmost respect to them were also human beings. And their fatwas and their rulings and understandings are based upon the knowledge that they knew. The fact of the matter, anybody who knows the most basic knowledge of modern chemistry cannot possibly hold the majority position anymore. Why? Because everything keeps on changing. The atoms in, in us would have been nudges at one point in time. They're going to be nudges at another point in time. Change is a part of nature. And we all are recycling our atoms. And what was nudges becomes tahir. What was tahir becomes nudges. What we eat goes out, comes in tahir, goes out nudges. Right? And what goes out nudges decomposes and fertilizes and comes out tahir again. With utmost respect... And this is not meant, a'udhu billah, to make fun of ya ikhwa, the classical scholars of Islam. Please don't read in. We would not be here without the classical and yes, even the medieval scholars of Islam. It's not a dis, a'udhu billah. It's just a fact. The scholars are human beings. And they just thought that something that is najis is going to remain najis forever. We love them. We respect them. But we now have knowledge of chemistry, knowledge of basic physics, knowledge that they did not have. Something that is najis 
when it changes and decomposes and completely becomes something else, it is no longer the original and it is no longer najis, it becomes tahir. We eat that which comes from the najis, it becomes tahir. Even physically we understand this. We can take urine and in the sim simple distillation in the most basic laboratory, extract pure water from urine. Can we not do this now? Right? Pure, the purest. In fact, many cities of the world, their drinking water is recycled water. You did not know this? Okay. This is well known. Now he's going to Google which city and never go there, right? Some of the largest cities in the world, their tap water, which they drink, is the najis that has been recycled. And everybody understands it's completely legit, right? And again, this shows us, my dear brothers and sisters, it's not a'udhu billah making fun of anybody. This. It's knowledge you build on what the past is. Jazakumullah khair. We, 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 we thank you for all that you've done. Now we take your contribution. We now benefit with what we know. We move forward. That's what knowledge is. When we do so, we're not trying to criticize the past. We're simply saying, we thank you for your services. We now need to move on. Nobody can ever claim that istihala doesn't change najis into tahir. This is now the default position of every modern school of our times and every council of fiqh across the globe even the shafi'i councils of fiqh have changed their madhab and they say istihala renders tahid into naj uh, sorry najis into tahid is that clear right now and this is the p position of all the scholars of modern times regardless of what the classical said because it's common sense and chemistry proves this now we firmly believe I, now what's the evidence by the way the evidence is many many evidences of them is vinegar Vinegar is an evidence Because what is vinegar? Many of us Muslims have no clue what vinegar is When you find out you're shocked You're like, is vinegar haram? That's the next question No, our Prophet ﷺ came home Hadith is in Bukhari And he said to Aisha That is there anything to dip the bread in? You know, condiment, is there anything? And she said, we only have vinegar And he said, give me the vinegar And he dipped the bread in vinegar And he said, what a great condiment Ni'mal idamu al khul What a great condiment is vinegar Vinegar is a great thing to dip your bread in You know, sabzi type of stuff Same thing you dip your bread in to eat in He ate vinegar Vinegar is completely halal by unanimous, unanimous consensus What is vinegar, O oh Muslims? Do you have ever, any idea what vinegar is? You would know What is vinegar? <laughs> it is khamr that has gone through the entire fermentation process. You cannot get vinegar without an intermediary of actual khamr. Why, O oh Muslims who, mashallah, alhamdulillah, may Allah keep us this blissfully innocent, we should keep this blissful innocence. Why do they cork alcohol? Why is alcohol always blocked? We don't want any air in it. They don't want, let me rephrase that. They don't want any air in it. Why? Because if you uncork the alcohol, and you leave it be, what happens? It becomes vinegar. That's what vinegar is. Vinegar is fermented alcohol. Right? Now, the majority of madhabs say that alcohol is nechus. Whether it is or not is a separate issue. I will talk about that one day. But that's the position they have. And the majority of madhabs, all the madhabs say, all the madhabs say that, that vinegar is tahir. You understand what's just happened here? Istihala. Istihala. The majority of madhab, all four madhab say that alcohol is najis. Khamr is najis. And all the madhab say vinegar is tahir. What just happened? Istihala. This shows us. Another example that is um, given as this is the issue of skin leather. Uh, our process and passed by a sheep. Hadith is in Abu Dawood. And the sheep was dead. It wasn't dhabah. It died. So, of course, nobody's going to eat the sheep. The process said, why don't you why don't you take the skin and use, use leather, get the leather from the dead animal. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, it's meita. It's a dead animal, it's najis. And our Prophet ﷺ said, tanning the animal purifies the skin. Tanning, sorry, tanning the skin, sorry, purifies it. Tanning the skin purifies it. Now, the skin, if you take it, filthy, wet, what not, this is najis, correct? Yeah. Now, you're going to tan it, which means you go through a chemical process, you put it in the sun, you do this and that, you completely change it. It's a complete transformation. It was najis, now it is tahir. So, this is the evidence in the sharia that clearly indicates istihala does make the najis into tahir. We are all understanding this point, right? Okay, final big section, then we are done. Now that I've proven istihala, is indeed legitimate in transforming najasa into tahara. 
the question we need to ask ourselves is the following. Is the extraction process for gelatin a valid istihala or not? This is the question. We agree that istihala changes najis into tahir. Agreed. Has gelatin undergone a sufficient istihala? Is this a fiqhi question or a chemical question? Who can tell me? Chemical question. So believe it or not, based on what answer a chemist will give, the faqih will have a different answer. You understand this point here? Once again, we are seeing different specializations coming into place. And if you Google, is gelatin halal? Without understanding this usul that I've taught you, this is all, this is all usul, without understanding this usul, and you quote me 10 ulama, seven of them or six of them will say gelatin is najis. Three or four will say gelatin is halal. And you go look up those three or four who say gelatin is halal. And they will say so based upon the understanding that istihala has occurred in gelatin. In fact, there is no disagreement amongst all the ten about the usul. The disagreement is in chemistry, not in fiqh, believe it or not. So who should we ask? A faqih or a chemist? For this issue, we need the faqih chemist. I'm a chemical engineer, by the way. Okay? I have a minor in chemistry. It's true, I do actually. It's all gone, by the way. It's all completely gone. Um, but who should we ask? The faqih or the chemist? In this case, we need to ask the chemist. We need to ask the chemist, has a genuine transformation occurred in the extraction process of gelatin? With my utmost respect to our fuqaha, once we have proven that istihala is good, and it is, we now need to find out whether istihala has occurred, and this is not the job of our fuqaha. They will not tell us if istihala has occurred in gelatin and in the extraction process. This is the chemist's job to tell us. We go to the chemist. I have been to over a dozen specialists, even though, inshallah, I am not a jahil in chemistry and I've done my own research and I have my own position, which is the same. I have personally asked over a dozen specialists, including PhDs in chemistry and biochemistry, including people that have specialized in collagen and in proteins. And I have found them unanimously to tell me the exact same thing as I concluded with my very basic knowledge of chemistry, and that is, what do you think? MashaAllah, you want the easy position. Before I answer you, let me tell you this. And when I tell you this, you'll know my answer. You can produce gelatin in your kitchen. It's very, very, very simple. You can literally Google how to produce gelatin in your kitchen. And you can take the bones put them in water, boil them, scrape a little bit, right? Take the bones out, you know, make the water evaporate, do this and that, and that is basically your gelatin. Where do you think I'm heading with this? <laughs> it is not a process that radically changes the structure. It is simply transferring that collagen from the bones of the animal into a substance that you can use for your food. It's a very, very, very basic surface level. It's not even fractional distillation level, if you know your chemistry and whatnot. It's a very basic level. And that is why, and one of my friends that I, I spoke with us about this, and he was very passionate, and he was writing a paper uh, for a fiqhi journal. He's a PhD in biochemistry, but he's writing a paper about istihala of gelatin, actually. And he said, just show me... Uh, any gelatinous structure, and I will tell you with basic microscopes that I have, whether it comes from a pig or a horse or a cow, just by looking at the structure from the microscope. That's how little change has occurred. That I can just look at it and I'll tell you where it's from. And in my own research in this issue, I think it is very clear that istihala, of course, changes najasa to tahara. Yes, we agree. But gelatin does not undergo a process of istihala. Gelatin does not undergo that process. You simply take the 
protein material from the bones of the pig and you transfer it into that candy or into that jello or into that pill that you are using for your medicine. And therefore, it retains its najasa. The verdict will be that it retains the najasa. Okay? Therefore, and by the way, this is the position of the Majma' al-Fiqh al-Islami, and I will always try to quote you Majma' al-Fiqh al-Islami because I have said many, many times, out of the modern councils of the world, it is the largest and earliest and most respected modern council. It meets in Mecca, Rabat al-Alam al-Islami founded it, and it's one that represents almost all of the dominant schools of modern Islam and geograph geographies and over a hundred ulama and Mufti Taqi Uthmani. All of these great ulama are part of this Majma' al-Fiqh al-Islami, OIC's yani, uh, Council of Fiqh, and they have... Um, their qarar, their, their decree, which is in front of me here, issued uh, October 31st, 1998, about the issue of gelatin. And it's in Arabic, and I simply say that it is allowed to use gelatin if it is extracted from halal sources that are slaughtered according to the sources of Islam. And it is not allowed to use gelatin that comes from haram sources like pig and the bones and the skin of pigs end of the fatwa. This is the fatwa of Majma' al-Fiqh al-Islami in Rabita and Makkah, where pretty much all the scholars that were there, they basically said, gelatin does not go istihala. It doesn't count as istihala. That having been said, our sister's question was about medicine. So we say, if the medicine is needed to sustain a reasonable level of life, it's not some beauty product, and there's no alternative to conditions, then this is darura. If either of these two conditions is not met, if you're taking something for beauty, it's not something that's needed for quality of life. Without it, you're going to suffer or not suffer. That's what you, it's not a matter of life and death, by the way. Gelatin is not that. It's a matter of, look, you cannot breathe normally. Your blood pressure is going to go high. Something of this nature where the quality of your life will be markedly different and you have a product here that has gelatin in it, right? And inside of it is your, your medicine. If you can find a halal alternative, for a price that you can afford, then you should go to that halal alternative. And I humbly say, most medicines will have a halal alternative. As far as I know, most medicines will have halal alternatives. Do the research, okay? I even know of a case where the doctor said to him, for this particular medicine, you don't really need the capsule. You can open the capsule, put it into water, then drink the water. Make sure you go to the doctor. Don't come to me. Go to your doctors, right? Again, yeah, people of Islam, don't ask scholars questions that they're not qualified to answer. A scholar is a human being. A scholar is also biased. A scholar has his own views. I cannot give you stock options. I cannot give you, you know, the fiqh of, you know, you go to me for what I know. And you go to the specialist for what they know. So if you have an alternative, excellent. If not, ask your doctor what not. Okay, this medicine... Can I, is it allowed for me to put in another substance without taking the capsule? And inshallah, this would be the ideal thing. If you're not able to, there's no substitute. And the doctor says, no, this has to go intact into your stomach. Whatever. In this case, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها And you're allowed to take this medication if there is no alternative. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we come to the conclusion of today's halaqa. Inshallah, tomorrow we will have our lecture. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما وظلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال